located at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, we our virtual tour will be of Dia de los Muertos or the spirit of Dia de los Muertos. Um, this program was originally devised uh, through a partnership with Pellissippi State Community College, but we're welcoming all comers. So if you're not from Pellissippi, we're glad you're here. Um, we're live streaming thanks to our incredible visitor services coordinator, who is our camera person, our cinematographer, Amanda Beasley. So thank you, Amanda. And the video can never really capture an exhibition um, fully. We hope that this is still a rich experience for all of you. And um, if you can't visit us in person, we hope that this still gives you a nice glimpse into this rich um, exhibition and program that we're providing for you today. So at this point, I wanna invite Wendy Bennett Turner from Pellissippi to just say a few words. So buenas tardes a todos. My name is Wendy Bennett Turner and I am a faculty member in the Modern Language Department at Pellissippi State. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the virtual tour on Dia de los Muertos. I'd also like to thank everyone who took the time to create this collaboration between our institutions. So muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Wendy. And I, I hope that my Spanish pronunciation is um, oh, at least 10% yeah. as lovely yeah. as yours. <laughs> um, so I also wanna introduce the real star of today's tour, um, Adrian, yeah, I know, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian Tafoya is the co-curator of the exhibition, The Spirit of Dia de los Muertos. Until very recently, she served as the McClung Museum's Registrar and Collections Manager. And now she is the NAGPRA Project Manager at California State University in Chico. So welcome, Adrian, we're so glad you're here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the conception of the exhibition and where the vision came from. Sure, um, thank you so much for having this opportunity and uh, to talk about the spirit of Dia de los Muertos, the exhibition that means so much to me as I dived into these, this concept in the community. Um, it came about when um, the pandemic shut everything down in 2020 and canceled many museum exhibitions uh, all over the world. And we were actually gearing, and I say we mean the museum, the Macon Museum, we were gearing up for a, um, an exit to borrow an exhibition on Mexican art, uh, a Mexican artist on Mexican modernity. Um, and so it was really devastating to, to have to cancel that. And we were already in the works with uh, the community for collaborations and, and certain events and everybody was excited. So just having that um, kind of deflated hope at that point when pandemic just shut everybody and everything down but I really wanted to hang on to this possibility. This, you know, the, the community was really excited about it and I wanted to see that happen at the McClung Museum. So I thought about some of the inspirations that I have experienced in my, my museum career and, and looking at all the museums out there that are doing wonderful things with Dia de los Muertos and thought, hey, let's bring that here. Let's bring some of that, that here and, and really dive into our, the community and have them drive this exhibition process and development and get their, um, partnerships and, and, and start doing that. And so I really just kind of dived into that concept and looked at the museum's already established relationships and, and connections with the community there at Not in Knoxville. And Leslie Chanjans, who is the, the curator of education, really had some wonderful connections that I could build upon and reach out to and look what happened. You know, just like, just was amazing to just start that right there and branch out to the community further and start the conversation. So bringing in the advisory group, the community advisory group was an amazing process to get individuals in the community on and off campus to take part in this, this conversation of exhibition development and really have passed the wheel on to, to hand over the wheel and say, what is it that we can do and, and bring through this project, this exhibition that you want to see and you feel really needs to be addressed as we approach Dia de los Muertos exhibition planning? Yeah, that's great. And I think that that really, that we'll really see that as we start mm -hmm. to tour into the exhibition that this was devised by and for the community. So mm -hmm. unlike a lot of what we think of as perhaps traditional exhibitions where there's a solo curator, it's almost more like it was an invitation for this participation. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And I've seen, yeah, and I've seen some of the, the most, the strongest 
examples of Dia de los Muertos at museums was that the community had the involvement from the very start and, and, and had the vision and, and drove, drove that exhibition to completion. And so it was really that sort of element that really lives in this exhibition that we, that we have right now. And you feel it, you, you'll feel it in the exhibition for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I'll point out that um, La Katrina is welcoming us on the right-hand side of the screen into the gallery. So I think we should take her up on her invitation. And mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about La Katrina a little later in the tour, but um, she's she's beckoning us. I think we should sure follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it says, come so, on in. Yeah, so why don't we um, move into our first ofrenda? Mm -hmm. And I'll say that a little bit about the history of Dia de los Muertos as we go. It's a very old celebration. It dates back about 3,000 years, um, in largely in what is now known as Mexico, but it was throughout Mesoamerica and extends into the Andes in some regions. Um, it was based out of a lot of indigenous traditions, but specifically the Aztec tradition. And a lot of the... Um, a lot of the symbols of Aztec tradition still live on today in La Frendas and in the celebration itself. And um, the one of the things that you'll see as we move through the exhibition is that Dia de los Muertos changes with time and culture. And that is that change and that shift is evident throughout. So even as um, the Spaniards were colonizing what is now Mexico and bringing Catholic missionaries in, that Catholicism kind of evolved into Dia de los Muertos. And you'll see those Catholic images and even the celebration itself shifted to November 1st and 2nd to match up with the Christian calendar. So it is um, a, a holiday, a celebration and a um, a, a pro, an event that has absorbed a lot of rich traditional history, even from the start. So this is the first ofrenda that we are being introduced to. This is a traditional ofrenda. And um, I will, I can say a whole lot about the different levels, but I think I want to hear from you, Adrian. Will you tell <laughs> us a little bit about this? I, I'm so, I'm so proud of this. Um, I was able to reach out and, and make connection with Martha Balthazar Robson, who is a Knoxville resident. And um, the connection was made through um, Centro Hispano and they introduced me to Martha. And she, oh, I was so lucky to, to get that connection with her. She has um, been creating ofrendas basically all of her life, mostly. <laughs> so one of them, but, you know, really she's been observing the celebration and um, honoring her past loved ones, relatives, and friends um, and through these the altars. And um, she has also spoken to Centro Hispano about the meaning and, and the importance of the altar and, and the elements within them. So she has been also mentoring others on, on how to create their, their altars and the ofrendas. So I think it was really great to have her part of this because she had also done museum um, exhibitions as well. But Martha is from Jalisco and she is incredibly excited about Dia de los Muertos every year. And she, every year it's, it's bigger, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's, it's larger than last year. So she kind of like, you know, tries to outdo herself every year, but she completely did an amazing job on this um, installation. And, and I watched her, I was able to watch her virtually put this together. And it really is something you feel as far as like being connected, where things go, what where they should be placed, uh, and really filling it up with this amazing celebration feel of, of all these flowers, these, these bright colors, the foods, um, the elements that we see in there, like the salt. Um, the, we have, oh, she also set up a mirror um, with, with a, a, a washcloth for, for those souls that are coming back to, to adorn themselves, to to re-energize, to refresh themselves. And so we see these elements in there too. This is really for them. This is this is something, an, an offering. This is this is more so come, you know, welcoming them, them back in our lives in this at this moment and celebrating with them um, and honoring them with certain objects that they they are familiar with, like with we use my my relatives in this altar, um, with my mother's personal items that are there placed on the altar with her Bible, her, 
her glasses, her handkerchief. Um, these are the things that she would use on a day-to-day -day basis. And some objects that are dear to them, like my, my great grandfather's you know, hat and his, his lasso. So I think it was really important to put those personal touches in there so that they can be called upon and, and, and be very you know, personal for them. So I think it really, this, this is an amazing you know, assemblage of, of just objects and meaning with, with deep meaning. So it was really great to watch her pull this together. It, it was, yeah nothing like nothing else i mean she was she was so great and, and was really careful to know what where the object should be placed and um in in relation to my my uh, my relatives for sure yeah and i think all those um layers of symbol are so important and i think that's one thing that we learned from martha is that you know within this imagery a lot of it does kind of go does go back to that aztec original indigenous celebration of people crossing from beyond to come back to visit. So this is an offering to those who have passed on, who are deceased, and it's to celebrate them and welcome them back and to create memory and create a place for them to feel welcome. So it's not an altar in that way that, you know, you might think of in a church or something. It's more of a living celebration. It's a welcoming space. And so the fruits, the breads um, are symbolic of the earth and the gifts to feed the hungry souls who have made this journey to come visit us. Um, La papeles picados are the cut out flags and paper and kind of symbolize the air and create an element of sim of celebration. Uh, the flowers um, would make frequent sense. Marigolds mm -hmm. are often are, are a flower of choice because they're in bloom at this time and they're so beautiful. Um, the salt and the water are so the souls can wash themselves after their long journey and pure them, purify themselves after their long journey. A lot of these types of symbols have been used for many, many years. The addition of the crosses and the, um, the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary symbols or the saints is one of those Catholic um, additions that came later with colonization with the, with the missionaries. And of course, photography mm -hmm. wasn't something that they had 3,000 years ago. So when photography was invented, it became important to now have the photos of your loved ones in there as well and mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. those images and memories alive. But I think too, those um, literal offerings of things that are personal to the to the people we're remembering those literal gifts you know here's your favorite set of glasses so when you come back you can still see and mm -hmm. read <laughs> and here's your here's your hat so you can put it on your head and here's your lasso you know I believe your grandfather's rope is there too so these yeah. things are are all offerings for those that we are trying to remember and it's that idea that um the mm -hmm. the souls are gone from us, but they can come back because they live on in us in that memory. And that is the, tr that is part of the celebration that we are keeping them alive through that memory. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to zoom in and kind of scan closer what's there or? We can yeah. give it a shot, but <laughs> maybe <Yeah>. not. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely have to enjoy, like, come and, and see it in person to see. The absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's so much richness to especially it, this one. And yes. I will say, too, that those offerings, the grains, the fruits, the legumes, they might be favorite foods of the, the deceased, or they might just be traditional foods or whatever is being harvested from around. There is a lot of variation from region to region, you know, depends mm -hmm. on what's happening in your town or city or, you know, the place you live and what's culturally important to your, your area. So ofrendas can be as personal as like your family or um, your community, but there mm -hmm. are some things that tend to be um, a little more typical, like the layered, yeah. um, the tiered steps and yeah. the the incorporation of the papeles and the the marigolds and i feel also the, the pathway that that yellow pathway that shows that's directing them to to this altar so i mm -hmm. think that was so important to highlight this yellow pathway that's bright brightly you know lit and and clear to have that pathway paved for them so it was really 
great to have her include that. Absolutely. And even within that, there's um, some money to, mm -hmm. so you can pay any tolls you might need to yep. pay if, if your soul is on this journey. And you can um, have that as a, as a way to um, kind of guide you through that journey because you might have to pay <laughs> for part yes. of your toll or to, you know, to some kind of entrance. Take your passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I really want to encourage you guys that are listening in that if you have questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A area. But why don't we move on to our next ofrenda? So our next ofrenda was created by children who are associated with the Centro Hispano organization. This was one of our community partners. And Centro Hispano is a organization here in Knoxville that seeks to empower East Tennessee's Latino community. So they really do a lot of great work. They have after school programs, they have training programs, they have, um, they do advocacy on behalf of the Latino community and they do a lot of different work, but they serve um, individuals from all across Latin America. And though Dia de los Muertos is most often associated with Mexico and Mexican heritage, and um, it is found in other parts of Latin America, but it is not in all of Latin America. So um, one of the things that the children did to celebrate is to focus on um, Alabrijes. And alabrijes are fantastical beasts and playful animals that were originally conceived by an artist named Pedro Linares in the mid 1900s. Um, they've since become a ubiquitous part of Dia de los Muertos and of Mexican folk art and is a really um, rich art form that focuses on creating uh, these marvelous animals that are joyful and playful. And um, I wanted to see if you wanted to say more about working with the students at Centro and this particular ofrenda yeah. and why you think it was important to include. Oh, I, well, I definitely wanted to include the, the, the kids, the, the little kids, because they are so great at creativity and imagination, imaginations, you know, so um, Centro Hispano was definitely one of the very first co collaborations, connections I made in, with the community advisory group. So uh, again, they introduced me to Martha Balcazar Robson. So uh, who is, I should mention, is a co-curator in this exhibition. But Centro Hispano and their after-school program, the kids there are were actually gearing up to create these puppets for a parade um, joining forces with Caddy Wampus, I believe it is. Um, and it was Big Ears, right? The Big Ears Parade in March this year that they were. So it almost, the stars almost aligned the fact that this was happening, um, that this was going to be the, the big part of, you know, their, their time spent during the year and definitely include them in the exhibition because they were going to focus on Alabrijes. Um, again, Alabrijes was a way to, to be inclusive of, of, of all cultures, of all cultures that may not observe, you know, the Dia de los Muertos um, celebration. So we wanted to make sure that we could tap into something that was fun and creative and imaginative for the kids to, to focus on. And, and they, what are their nine op puppets here? I think there are nine. And so I didn't realize until I saw it was like this, the peacock um, figure was just so amazing. And it's like, wow. So yeah, we really did um, get, you know, fortunate to, to have this come together at this point where the kids were creating I hope people look at that the QR codes that show them making the actual puppets so it really is a cool process to watch them really get down and dirty with, with the with the materials and, and and create and have fun and that's what this was about you know this is this is about um you know making you know some some joyous times together I mean to me it was a moment of creating that was just so profound especially with the uh, traditional friend, but I'm sure the kids had a great time making them. Absolutely. I think that uh, they really capture the joy and the spirit and the celebration. And um, even that idea of having a parade around Dia de los Muertos yeah. is a new integration. That was not something that actually was um, a part of Dia until... And I've been told this by a reputable scholar <laughs> that it actually started with the James Bond film. That, That's what I heard too. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Dr. Pendry for that great fact because 
Originally, parades were not a part of Dia de los Muertos. It was a local community celebration that, you know, infiltrated and was participated in in a lot of communities. But they are, um, but now there are these parades that happen because after this James Bond film where they wanted a parade in Mexico City, uh, they, folks who celebrated Dias loved the pageantry. So it became a part of the celebration. And these animals, to answer a question from Ivy, um, are made out of paper mache. So there would be a base underneath that I believe is wire um, or some kind of form. And then using um, paste and paper to go over top and then paint and cardboard to kind of add the ears or add the wings and to add the color. On some of them, there's uh, little puff balls glued on or in some of them are bedazzled with jewels. And, uh, but a lot of them have um, tempera paint making that beautiful vibrancy and color and that cardboard and combination of tape and maybe even paper mache and paper to make them. So they're light as a feather. You can pick them up and you can move them around. And indeed you can see, um, you can see the children using them in the parade afterward um, through the QR code. And I'll be sure to share with our participants uh, the links that um, Adrian referred to because they're in really nice videos um, of the children using these and having them in the parade or at least images rather. I'm not sure if there's a video. I should, shouldn't say that without knowing it in advance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not but, sure what happens will happen to them, right? After the, they'll most likely go back to Centro Hispano. Um, yeah. Hopefully on, they'll put them on exhibit there. Um, <laughs> sure, and see. live on, you know, and I, I can picture them ending up in, in living rooms. <laughs> True. Back home with the children. <laughs> oh. And um, I will, I will talk about the skulls shortly. I'm not mm -hmm. ignoring that question, Ellie. So thank you. Um, so speaking of alabrijes, we're going to look at a couple that were um, created uh, by an artist here in Knoxville named Hector Salvador. And Hector Salvador, Salvador. Oh, thank you. Gosh, Salvador. what did I say? I know. Yeah, well. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Hector and his work, Adrian? Oh, Hector, um, he, I was connected with him through... Um, Ola, Ola Latina, um, Casa Ola Gallery, and um, part of their their artist network. So they they said, "Oh, come come see what what Hector um, does with the Alabrijas." And so I did, and I was looking at um, an exhibition that he had there, and I was like, "Yes, we definitely need to have him part of this exhibition." And um, he creates these figures out of paper mache. Um, some also he does in clay, but mostly it's paper mache plaster um, and um, paint. So these figures he's been doing, I'm not sure for, but he's been an artist, you know, for, for since 2010, I believe. Um, and he has been creating, you know, these figures for a long while and is very noted for, for his Alabrijas figures. But I went to his studio and visited his and got to see his work as well beyond that. That's when I got to meet La Catrina, who we'll talk about later. <laughs> but yeah, no, we we really wanted to have his work represented here and, and also talk about, you know, um, the, the creative side of making something from an imagination and, and being playful. And I think to me, again, that's the spirit of Dia de los Muertos is playfulness and imagination and, and really continuation of life, that celebration. So really um, excited about Hector being part of this exhibition for sure. Absolutely. And including, you know, a, a noted artist and showing that vibrancy of our, you know, city as a maker space and a maker place where artists live and thrive from various mm -hmm. cultures, you know, and, and how um, I like that this shows how these, you know, fantastical animals um, live on even from the beginning, which was with uh, Pedro Linares. So mm -hmm. it's, He's, you know, he's an example of an artist who has taken that conception and turned it into his own. These are also made out of paper mache, and they are um, they are painted, I believe, with acrylics, mm -hmm. and um, you know, can stand on their own right. So they're gorgeous and lovely creatures that would 
joyfully welcome you into the celebration and be a part of the joy that is Dia de los Muertos. But really, alabrijes can be a part of everyday life and um, everyday celebration as a type of art form. Yeah, and you know, he he does, um, he, he, he does, it, he teaches, you know, he does um, some, some art classes as well. So it'd be really cool to see him um, grow his, his, you know, community networks through, through this exhibition as well and, and to come to classes and such to, to help, you know, people with their designs and, and creations. So yeah, he's incredible. He loves, you know, showing his, his craft and his artwork and, and, and sharing that with, with all ages. Absolutely. And speaking of his work, we also have two examples that we'll have Amanda slowly move toward, <laughs> which are um, calaveras or skeletons. So one of our questions was about the skulls and calaveras are what, probably some of the most famous images associated with Dia de los Muertos. They've really captured populate um, popular imagination in India as opposed to say, you know, our Anglo Halloween celebrations. Skeletons are joyous, they're playful, they're mischievous. Um, and they were also conceived by a Mexican artist. Only this artist's name is Jose Guadalupe Posada. He was working in the early 1900s, just before the Mexican Revolution. And he started using these joyful skeletons in his um, illustrations. He was a political cartoonist, an illustrator, a printmaker. And in court, he used the skeletons to poke fun at political um ideologies and to make satire about people in power and kind of in the idea was that beneath your wealth beneath your class beneath your status we're all just skeletons you know in the end nothing you have put on top is going to hide the fact that you're really just a skeleton um, and since his time the calaveras have transcended and they've really become a part of Mexican artistry, but also truly a part of Dia de los Muertos. And um, why do you think that these two in particular, these were also made by Hector, and uh, why were these too important for you to include, Adrian? Oh, I just, I, we had to include them because I think they represent the playfulness um, that exists in, in the afterlife. And I think it really just like kept, just really just hones in on that continuation of life that these this child is playing with this with the dog and, and, and involved in their favorite game um, so it really does to me um, it represent that continuation of life and, and playfulness that is the spirit of Dia de los Muertos um, yeah and with, with with the skeletons like the, the highly decorative skeleton um, and and the skulls it really kind of pokes fun at death it's just kind of like look, look at how happy we are we can paint our face, we can wear these flowers and, and, you know, the, the representation of sugar, the, the sweetness of life, you know, I think really was really a great way to capture all of that. Yeah, yeah, I, I love these two. I, these are also paper mache and wire and paint. Mm -hmm. And they're really, um, the line is so playful of these two sculptures. They're really pretty fantastic. So it's, Dog and Child at Play are the yeah. titles, um, but they are really fantastical creatures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's move on to our next ofrenda. And so in this one, you'll see those sugar skulls again, examples of a little bit bigger. And the sugar skulls, as Adrienne alluded to, are, are decorative skulls to kind of help you understand that, you know, death and life are both joyous. They can both be celebrated. They're part and partial to each other. And the sugar is to show that you can kind of consume and feed on the joy and the living and the, the celebration, you know, as a candy and as a, as a treat. So this is a group ofrenda. It's not, so. it's another example of one that kind of keep some of those traditional elements from the traditional ofrenda, but this one was made by a group of individuals. And um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this one, Adrian? Yeah, so yes, again, this is what makes this one different from the traditional ofrenda was that was about a, a specific family 
a few family members within the family unit. And this, um, this installation has in several represent, you know, family members represented because it's the group of Frenda. And I thought was incredibly, you know, important for them to be, to have their space as a group to be able to represent and, and acknowledge and honor their loved ones in this installation. And I think it was um, the lasso and um, lags. I'm sorry, you might have the, the pronunciation, the whole name uh, <laughs> for those two groups, but the UT students really wanted to get the, the students on campus to be involved in this exhibition as well. And this is what they came up with. They were inspired by um, the Disney movie where there's this peek through this this ofrenda that this child was looking through and and this this area where it was a, an honoring of their of their family members so they were inspired by that and they just kind of like really ran with that and in, included all of their their members in their in their groups to be a part of this and i think it was you know really successful and it's it's really sensitive and and delicate and and i to me i think it just really touches upon that that individualness um and yeah, so I think it was it was really wonderful to have them in here, to have them yeah represent represent the families, represent each other and their loved ones, and be inspired. Yeah, absolutely. And the the students are the Latin American Student Organization and the Latinx Association of Graduate Students, and it is really it really does show how photography and the image of the the loved one has become so important for keeping those memories alive and even within this though there are little elements of personal things like there are some liquor bottles for people's favorite cocktails there are um there are nods to favorite dishes or favorite pieces of food or types of food so those personal effects are still there even though the photography has been more the focus of this one than the traditional ofrenda mm -hmm. and um i think it just goes to show that like the the importance is to keep that memory alive because if you in in the aztec tradition aztec tradition in that original indigenous tradition there is the way you die as an individual but you are kept alive through that memory and keeping keeping that memory close keeps you in a certain level of aliveness rather than descending into another level of death where you're forgotten so that that level of remembrance is really important within the dia tradition and celebration mm -hmm. So our next ofrenda is another contemporary example, and it is really highly stylized with a lot of artistic meaning. It comes to us from West High School, so it's an, yet another community partner created this ofrenda, another group, and West High School is one of, is the most diverse high school in Knoxville. It has um, a very diverse student population and the students really contributed and wanted to celebrate their diversity and it this one's called the tree of light and i wanted to see what you had to say about this one adrian oh yes um i knew i mean some you know something about me was like oh we have to tap into that high school you know the high school community that i knew as a high schooler myself we were just so vocal and and so creative and I and I knew that something would be would be wonderfully brewing there at the at the high school, and so I really was excited to include the high school students in this. And they came out with this amazing, you know, idea of the tree of light, and and representation, and and really wanted to do some of this elaborative, you know, installation. And they they truly pulled it off. So I mean, it was really a. a a true test to their to their to their excitement and commitment to this work um but yeah to see it in person is is something else i mean you really there's so many details to this that you really have to zo zoom in and and you could spend a long time just looking at everything and all the people that are represented in these like what are those hex hexagon shaped frames are you know people that we all knew uh, and that we it has inspired us in some way and, and as well as them you know obviously so we really wanted to make sure that you know we we do take take in all of these special elements that are included in this tree of light 
So yeah, in person is, is a must. You must see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say though, we're, our cinematographer is doing a phenomenal job, but this one is so detailed. It is yeah. really um, has a lot to it. One of the things that I think is so interesting about this ofrenda is that it shows societal remembrances and societal mourning and the importance of keeping people alive, um, even if you didn't know them personally, because incorporated into this are famous people. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, even a few musicians and artists and scholars that the students, you know, respond to and are inspired by are incorporated into, into this, along with, you know, relatives and people that the students might have known personally. But it is that idea of that that communal remembrance still being so important that is really highlighted at the base of the tree. Mm -hmm. So at the base of the tree are images of the students who were murdered in Uvalde and the teachers who were killed in Uvalde. And by incorporating those individuals, even though they were not personally known to the students at West High School, they're keeping those memories alive and they're keeping them in their hearts and they're making sure that those individuals are mourned collectively and by society and maybe even the students are making a statement about what they want to see in their society, which is also, you know, an overtone that can be incorporated into Dia de los Muertos, that there can be societal critique and that there can be the idea that we have to keep keep our focus on certain things and certain people and keep them alive, even if they have lost their own dreams and hopes. And by having the tree as coming up from those students, they're showing the students as like the base of, you know, continued growth, continued learning, continued life, that it hasn't ended, that it keeping them alive and keeping that memory is, is important. It truly is one of those combination of all the things that we've seen so far. It's like the remembrance and then it's pushing forward, you know, that, that acknowledgement of people that have touched our lives that we want to remember that we want to honor and acknowledge uh, that has shifted our world you know in 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 ways that you know that are not you know great and ways that are great so it really is a balance there of of, of continuation and uh, yeah collection of of memory absolutely so let's move to our final ofrenda And our final ofrenda is another example of our how Dia de los Muertos can um, be a societal critique and can be a collective remembrance as much as it can be very personal and intimate. So it's not removing one or the other, but it's kind of a both. Um, I wanted to see if you wanted to talk about this one, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. This one is is um, from Laura Contreras, and she was she really is um, close to this this topic of the U.S. Mexico border crossing, the, the lives that were lost, um, and she really does you know want to convey you know the, the the impact, the seriousness, and and the lives that that really touched us as far as you know them trying to reach that net, that dream that, that escaping. From where they're coming from, from those, from that terrible situations that that are going on, and 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 trying to reach a better life. So I think it really is something that she she really personally put herself in in that situation where it was like this is incredibly hard situation that she wants to make sure that she conveys. It's important that we recognize and remember and acknowledge and and also be advocate and voices for 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 better you know better ways forward and I think what was came across was just that that sense of these, these individuals that that have lost you know that that dream of having that next life that, that had that escaped the, the traumas and and we we do face this every day especially now what's going on <laughs> so yeah um yeah yeah and this one's called interrupted lives or dreams and it it um 
it again shows that importance of remembering, even, even if the remembering is that of people whose face you might not know, that you don't have to have the image to have the memory or to hold them close and to celebrate them and to welcome them. So it's creating a welcome even beyond what perhaps they had at the time when they were making their crossings, but it's creating a welcome to keep them in our hearts, to keep that memory alive and to maintain that, you know, a symbol of, of what could be a better society and to kind of call us to maintain that commentary. It's using art and artistry in that way to comment on how our society is viewing individuals and to humanize people who might've been lost or who were lost as they sought asylum or migrated or tried to cross the border. Yeah, and she had um, created those, the, the, the clothespins on those wires as, as individuals, the individual lives that have been lost of various colors. Um, and there is red wire that runs through it, which is the bloodline, which she explained to me. So I thought that was incredibly profound. And, and the, the frames with the blank frames, but, but the various colors that representing those individuals, their, their lives that have been lost and their articles, their clothing articles on the, on the bottom platform, which is more, you know, gives you more of a personal connection to these individuals. And really, it really raises awareness and, and for you to be thinking about that. But I also wanted to also look at the kite up in the ceiling as well. The kite um, was incredibly successful and beautiful that she, that she created. We were talking about kites and um, how some, there, there are kites that fly up in the air that, that for, for remembering, being closer to, to, the, to the world and, and, and remembrance. So I think the, the kite was incredibly uh, profound. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if we can point up that high, but <laughs> oh, <darn>. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stand under it to to, to Yeah, to it's true. It. Oh, here yeah. we go. All right, ah. we're moving up. Oh, yeah. there it is. Yeah. There's the kite. And There's so the, the kite, kite was also made out of paper oh. and combined pieces of paper, like a collage style and some paint. So it is um pieced together, beautiful, delicate ephemeral pieces of paper. So again, kind of playing on that idea of the papeles picados, but also the kite and that I love that idea of connecting the earth and the sky and the air and the the ground, which is yeah. one of those symbols that that harkens back to the Aztec time and the indigenous individuals and their traditions is that connection of air to Dia de yeah. los Muertos. Definitely. And I like the idea of like just carrying their memory and their honor and their wishes that have, you know, through just carrying it through this kite. And it's just, it's still there, you know, that, that still want to have that. Absolutely. That yeah. And again, moment. it, this one shows that having the photography is but having not necessary to remember people, you know, we didn't, we don't have the photography of these individuals, but we do have their, their memories mm -hmm. and we're keeping them alive by remembering. And carrying their dreams for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So lastly, we are going to turn to works by Susana Enriquez, who talked about La Katrina as promised. So La Catrina was probably the most famous cal calavera um, mm -hmm. originally conceived by Jose Guadalupe Posada. Um, and these are two paintings that show her, um, show the figure of La Catrina as envisioned by Susanna. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Susanna and working with her? Oh yeah, Susanna is a, wonderful Knoxville artist and she paints with the smallest of small paint brushes. She's very exact and precise and technical. Um, so she was excited to be part of this exhibition that she actually painted these these two uh, pieces for the exhibition. And she decided to do, to go with La Catrina um, and she wanted to speak to uh, La Catrina and, and how sometimes, you know, 
there are people that want to deny their, their cultural heritage and and um, wants to you know pretend like that mix their their culture isn't you know part of them but it really is and so I think it was really great for her to come up with um, these two small and they're very intricate so yeah you have to enjoy this to be uh, you know to to really take in her work and her um, skill I mean she's amazing I mean she's done a lot of exhibitions um, in, in in the area at KMA at the Knoxville Art Museum and at um, the Ola Latina gallery as well so I think it she's she just had to be part of this and she was so great to 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 actually get them done because it takes so much time you know and so you know there's a lot of time in this and in, in creation and plus you know she's gotta she's gotta have you know everything just right and, and they're so beautiful they are so beautiful that it was wonderful to have her part of this exhibition Absolutely. The colors are really rich. And this is also acrylic, and I believe it's on canvas, or at least the centerpiece is on canvas, and, the, and then it's canvas mounted on board. another canvas or a board. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Canvas mm -hmm. board. Canvas. So, um, you know, it's kind of a double layer painting mm -hmm. of a, a very intricate, well dressed, <laughs> decorated La Katrina. And Katrina mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, as you said, one of those ubiquitous characters who has become famous for many things, but originally is political satire that she was critiquing people who thought they could be very European in their fancy European dress as opposed to um, wearing more traditional indigenous inspired Mexican clothing and being truly um, Mexican centric rather than Eurocentric. And so she, she became someone of a celebration and let's look at Hector's uh, Katrina for comparison. Let's get up close and personal with her to kind of conclude our tour around. So as we go back to where we started, you can see our Katrina up close and personal. While the original Katrina by um, Posada was dressed in, you know, very Victorian style clothing, you know, the big fancy dress and bustle this Katrina's dress for a party <laughs> and I think she's really personal to you Adrian so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about her yeah so I, I obviously I saw her at uh, Hector's studio and um, we really wanted to include her in the exhibition because it was very important for the advisory committee uh, for the advisory group to have Katrina greet the visitors into the gallery um, to welcome them to the party and that was truly the, um, the vision. And so when we were talking to him about, you know, getting her prepared for this party, um, he went and um, dazzled her up. She, he uh, changed, she had a, a, a dress that was a different color then, but he, he changed her dress up. He added elements to her hat and to her, to her to the side of her head. So this was so great that for him to be able to do this. He also added um, Quetzalcoatl that the, 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 uh, the serpent, the plume serpent around her, her neck that she, that's draped around her. So it was really great to see that, you know, that ancient, you know, that, that God, that creation God around her, and then just having represented two worlds of the, of the contemporary, the modern and the ancient come together. So it really is, it was fun to see that and see where, where he went with her, but he wanted to, to, to give a nod to UT with the orange dress. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I, I'm sure we all appreciate that. Go Vols. <laughs> but certainly the inclusion of the serpents. I mean, if um, if you think about the Mexican flag, the serpent is even on the Mexican flag, but uh, the, the deity is originated from Aztec and culture and Aztec tradition and speaks to, and a, the, gave the gift of humanity to people, gave art, gave knowledge, gave, symbolizes the cycle of life. Um, so there he is with her, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> bringing us into the gallery. And today I hope that she is um, welcoming us to think more about Dia de los Muertos. I, I will say that I have like hundreds of pages of information about Dia. There's so much to learn about this tradition. It is very rich. It's unlike um, any tradition I can compare in an Anglo uh, 
culture. It's it's unique and in the world, I feel personally. Yeah. But I and I think that there's a lot to learn about it and a lot to celebrate. And I hope that um I hope that we gave you some things to think about and consider the next time you see uh Dia mm -hmm. de los Muertos costumery or or what rewatch coach coco with fresh eyes or um see the celebration happening in your own communities i want to mm. pause really quickly to see if anybody has any final questions i think we've gotten to all the ones i saw come earlier and i just want to also sorry to just like just give a shout out to rebecca ortiz and and her the exhibition image that she created for us specifically um, that that image that is all over now is for all over <laughs> social media and all the, on on the building. So you know her her image that includes some of those those symbolisms in her in her artwork. So yeah, she was amazing to have have on board and um, to just many thanks to her. Oh, thank you for that, Adrian. Yeah. Because you're correct. The beautiful image that we've used to market the show to share. Um, as Adrian said, was a digital illustration created by Rebecca Ortiz, an incredible artist, and mm -hmm. it's a it has been a delight. Yes, local incredible artists for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I want to thank everybody. I want to thank um, Pellissippi for you know prompting this this tour, and to you, Wendy, for joining us. And I want to thank all of our guests who listened in. And I especially want to thank Amanda, our in intrepid cinematographer, video artist, <laughs> for going on this journey with us. And I thank also you. really, really want to thank you, Adrian, for sharing your time, your talent, your expertise, your passion for this exhibition, and then for this little virtual tour. Oh, it's my pleasure. And it's so exciting to see it. You know, I'm, I'm miles and miles away, but I love seeing it no matter what. And I love to know how everybody's enjoying it. And I just, yeah, thank you so much, Katie, for pulling this together. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to give you guys five minutes back to your day. Thank you so much and um, have a wonderful rest of your, your weekend. Thank you.